ready to go. I'm not a I'm not a resolution person. Are y'all who who's a New Year's resolution person? Where you do it, right? Write them down. The New Year's resolution is raise your hand when somebody asks you if you're a resolution person. Right? Yeah, I've never been a big resolution person, but I do it, at the beginning of the year. I think it's good to be purposeful about the things that you you plan to do this year, right? Whether you call it a resolution or not. I, had a friend that used to always go to his cabin in the mountains, and he and his wife would sit down and write down all the goals they had for the year, right? Um, he didn't call it a resolution. He calls it his goals list. I, maybe they are a resolution. But let's do one thing for sure this year, uh, something that my granddaddy was really, really good at doing. Um, he would always say, I guess maybe not always, that's pretty exclusive, isn't it? But, but I heard him say a lot. Um, Lord willing, Lord willing, and, and, and we still hear that, don't we? I don't know how, how are you at that? I, I'm not the best at saying Lord willing. Um, I need to be better at that. Uh, why? You know, I was thinking about this for the past week or so as I was thinking about resolutions. We, we make resolutions to lose weight or whatever, Lord willing, I'll lose weight, right? Um, uh, we make resolutions... But we do we our goals or whatever we do, do we but do we put God in the middle of it? And why do we need to put God in the middle of it? What does that recognize? What does it recognize for us when we put God in the middle of the plans that we make? Uh, one of the things that we have been struggling with, I believe, as society over the past couple of years is is that finding out that we're really not in control, are we? As much as we want to be in control, <laughs> and as much as maybe two years ago or whenever it was, we felt like we were in control, we're really not in control. And when we say Lord willing, it reminds us not only that we're not in control, but our God who knows so much more than us, who put us together, who sees the steps of our life, is in control. Let me just read to you the scripture of where this comes from. It comes from um, James, the fourth chapter, uh, starting in verse 13. It says this. It says, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a, a year there and trade and make a profit. Verse 14. Yet do you not know what tomorrow will bring? Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you're a mist and that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Evil is the, is the separation of you and God, the separation of God. Anything where we don't have God in our life is evil by definition, right? Um, all such boasting is evil. So whoever uh, knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Let's make a resolution together that we as God's people, as his body, are going to put God in the middle of everything that we do and not forget and not slip up and to remember to say, Lord willing. Let's pray together. Father God, we're, we're so blessed to be here today, and we're thankful that you're our God, that you're our creator, that, that you are sovereign as the God who, who, who makes life, the God who takes life, and God who creates all that we know and all that we are. God, in this year, as we, as we go into a new year, as we have expectations of a new year, as we have hope for the new year, God, help us to put you in the middle of all that we do. God, seeking your wisdom in your ways, in all that we do, in the lives, our business life, in our, in our lives when we play, and certainly in our spiritual lives as we reach out to others in this world, as we increase our spirituality and connect with you more vertically to you, as we in, in increase our knowledge that you are God. God, bless us now as we worship you, as we lift you above all. As we ask in Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning, church. If it is convenient, would you stand with me for the first song? Praise the Lord.
Let's pray. Father, it is certainly good to be here this morning uh, singing songs of praises to you. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us today to, to worship you, to study your word, and to gather around the table, Lord. Lord, at this time, as we look around this room, uh, we, we notice that many of our number are not with us this morning, and some are traveling, other are, are at home sick or, or just uh, trying to, to be safe right now. Uh, Lord, uh, as we start to see uh, more and more cases of COVID in our area, uh, we just pray for your protection, Lord. We pray for uh, clear minds and good decision-making. And Lord, we just pray that uh, if it be your will, that you will put this uh, disease to an end, Lord. Uh, we just thank you so much for the lessons that we have learned uh, in the past year, and we are grateful for a year that we can resolve to better ourselves. Um, as Ted mentioned earlier, we, we just pray that it be our resolution to keep you in the middle of all things, Lord. Uh, remove our stubbornness, remove our pride, help us to draw nearer to you. Uh, we thank you for, for Harold and uh, his willingness to serve you here. We just pray that as he brings your word to us this morning, that we will be receptive, that we will be encouraged, and that we will use uh, what we learned today uh, to, to be a better example for you. We thank you so much for your son uh, and his death on the cross, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity that it provides for us to live with you uh, eternally, Lord. We love you and we thank you, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. How are you today? Oh, look up here and smile at me, please. I need it. You know, y'all, I appreciate you being here. I appreciate those who have joined us online. And uh, we are so grateful for you being here. This, is, uh, this slide is actually our theme for this year, Together We. And it's going to be taken from the book of Acts at the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2. And I'll read these verses in just a few minutes this morning. But it's at the heart of what we want to look at this year and be thinking about how we'll do uh, together uh, wonderful things for the Lord. Of course, he's at the center of all of it, and uh, we want to give him the glory. But this is our theme slide, that we are going to do this together. We're always better together. You believe that? We are an imperfect group of people, y'all. We, we always have been. And, um, and with an imperfect preacher... No amens. Hey, I appreciate that. And, um, and <laughs> but we are still God's idea. We're the best thing 
um, that needs to exist on this earth for the benefit of the Lord. We are his hands. We are his feet. And we are uh, serving together. We're working together. We're not just singing together and worshiping together. Certainly we're doing that. But all of these things collectively we're doing to the glory of God and we'll always be stronger together. And so that's the idea this year. And so I just want to introduce a very simple principle this morning uh, about us being together in fellowship, us uh, spending time with one another, us encouraging one another, us maybe being not so much a, um, a wall, but a bridge and to let down our defenses, to, uh, to allow people in, to share our lives with other people. And um, I'm not saying we haven't done that, or it hasn't been done in the past, because it has, but I'm saying collectively, as we grow together and share together, evangelize together and worship together, uh, we are a force to be reckoned with in this world. In fact, Jesus said not even the gates of Hades will prevail against this force. So I believe there's great power in it, and there's great power in you being part of this family. How many of you are old enough to remember Gilligan's Island? You remember Gilligan's Island? Yeah, you yeah, okay. A lot of old folks out here today. And we, uh, I, I love uh, Gilligan's Island. You know, if you remember the premise, premise of Gilligan's Island, um, Gilligan was a mate. Uh, uh, there was a skipper and a mate. They were going to be, uh, they were going, leaving Honolulu. They were leaving the Hawaiian Islands, and they were going on a three-hour tour. You remember that? That three-hour tour turned in, sorry about singing, and that three-hour tour turned in to a three-year sitcom. And the sitcom was that these guys were on a storm. They left on this excursion. It was only supposed to take a, a, you know, a couple hours. And a storm came up, and they ended up getting stranded on an island. So it's Gilligan, the skipper, and it's five other people. Seven people are stranded on this island. And the whole show, the whole premise of the show is not only are they trying to get off of this island, um, but it's also about these seven people from different backgrounds and different walks of life learning to live life and getting along together uh, on an island. And uh, a lot of us romanticize islands. We love the Hawaiian Islands, and many of you have been there, some even recently. Uh, have been there. It's a beautiful place. We've been to the Bahamas. It's a beautiful place. And many years ago, I spoke in the Bahamas in, um, and met some wonderful people as part of the church. And one of the members there came up to me and said, Mr. Harold, you see us as an island, a paradise. But he said, we have a lot of problems here. And we have a lot of struggles on this island. And what you see, you know, at the hotels and on the beaches isn't anything what really is going on in this island. And, uh, and he's right. I, and I think a lot of us view not only places we visit like that, the Hawaiian Islands and the Bahamas, but I think we kind of, we live life on an excursion and we see life sort of as a tourist in that we really don't know what's going on around us or maybe we don't care, we don't get involved. And there's a lot of heartache and a lot of uh, discouragement. And especially on the island, like in, on the islands of Bahamas, um, there's a lot of family issues, a lot of family struggles, uh, a lot of problems um, uh, where, where that's concerned. And so they, they fight. Satan uses that, and they fight it. And so on this island, uh, Gilligan and, uh, and his crew, uh, they, they just try to get along with people. You know, in, in one sense, the church is a lot like Gilligan's Island. Um, we're on the same ship or we're on the same island. It's called Earth. Um, we're waiting on someone to rescue us. That is, the Lord is going to come back and he's going to rescue us one day, so to speak. He's going to take us home. We know that he came the first time in reference to sin. He's coming a second time. It's not going to have anything to do with sin. It's going to have to do with bringing his children home. And so he's going to come into this planet. And he's going to rescue us and he's going to redeem us. Um, he's going to save us and he's going to bring us home. But in the meanwhile, while we're here on this planet, We've got to learn to get along. We, we've got to learn to, um, to encourage each other and live together and, um, and be together as, as one. And I, I want to remind you this morning something you already know, and that is the church is God's idea. This wasn't my idea. You're right. The, the church was God's idea, and it's a great idea. We ought to celebrate the fact 
that God put together the church and redeemed the church and he put us together as a family because many times the church is called the family of God. He put us together as a family and there is fellowship within that family. The word in the Bible for fellowship is koinia and it, uh, it's used 19 times in the Greek New Testament. It's the idea of fellowship and communion and community and participation and contribution. I think it could be one of the most overused, undervalued words in the church. Because a lot of times we talk about fellowship, we really aren't talking about the fellowship in the New Testament church. We're talking about maybe getting together in the fellowship hall and eating, right? Because you can't have fellowship unless you have food. We're talking about getting together and, and just hanging out together, that's fellowship. And that may be a little bit of fellowship, but that's not what the New Testament church had in mind when they started talking about fellowship. And so there's just a basic principle that I want to share with you this morning, and it is about being together. Now, if you have your Bible with you, I'm, I'm, I'm going in a few minutes to Acts chapter 2, and I'm going to read that. But if you want to turn your Bibles, it, it'll be easy to find in the book of Genesis, the very first book you get to. In the book of Genesis, in fact, God be, began to create. He created this planet. He created the world. He created the water and he separated the land and all of that was good and there was a time though if you recall that God looked at the earth and it was the first time he said something was not good and he looked at Adam and Adam's uh, as he named the animals as he lived in this garden he looked at Adam and he saw that it was not good for Adam to be alone this is Genesis 2 in the 18th verse and the Lord said, it's not good that man should be alone. I'll make a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground of the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature was its name. And so Adam gave names to all the cattle and the birds of the air and to every beast of the field. For Adam, there was, uh, for Adam, there was not a helper that was comparable to to be found. And so he, God looked around and he saw he's got these animals, he's named all these animals, but Adam was uh, alone. And I think the principle of this is it's not good for us to be alone. It has never been good for us to be alone. You think it's good. Sometimes you, you think you need to be alone. You wish you could be alone, um, but it is not good for you to be uh, alone. In fact, the Hebrew construction of that verse is actually a double negative. It, it, it accentuates the negative part of that verse. It reads like this, not good, not good is man alone. It says it twice. It is not good that we are alone or that we spend time alone. And so he creates all these different things and after a period of time he says it's not good and it's not good that Adam's going to spend time alone and so he fixes the problem and by the way Adam is he is elated if you know the 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 text God brings uh this woman woman means out of man and so he forms woman and when uh Adam sees her he is like wow and he is taken back so uh God knows what he's doing right when he made Adam, he knows what he was doing when he made Eve, and he brings Eve to Adam, and at their introduction, Adam is taken back, and he, there is a, a, a new dimension to Adam's life. Yes, it's important that he get along physically. Yes, it's important that we have a spiritual life, but y'all, there is an emotional and a, uh, a, a, um, a social element uh, to what we do spiritually that I think is so important. Uh, we, a guy by the name of Dr. Leonard Kramer, uh, a psychiatrist, he worked for 30 years, he was treating depression, and he made this statement, I want to use this statement here and quote him, he said, the human being is the only species that can't survive alone. The human beings need other human beings. So folks, community is the divine norm. Fellowship is the divine norm for God. You won't grow, you and I won't grow emotionally. We won't, won't develop uh, spiritually. We, we will not be what God intends us to be on our own. So we need other people to help us uh, along the way. And then if, you, if you're following the outline, I want to also read Proverbs before I go to the book of Acts, but I want to read Proverbs chapter 18. In verse 1, uh, this is Proverbs 18, verse 1. The Bible says, a man who isolates himself 
seeks his own desires, he rages against all wise judgment. A man, I'm going to read it again, who isolates himself, seeks his own desires, he rages against all judgment. Later on, verse 24 of Proverbs 18, by the way, Solomon in all of his wisdom said, a man who has friends must himself show himself to be friendly, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a, a brother. So I get it. I get it that we want to be isolated. When bad things happen to us, when people hurt us, when people say things to us or they challenge us or we just are sick of people, I get it. You want to go away. You want to be on a Hawaiian island. In fact, you, not only do you want to be on that Hawaiian island, you don't want anybody else on that island with you. You don't even want Gilligan around because he's so annoying. And so the more people you're around when you're hurt, the more aggravated you are. I get that. I really do. In fact, Jesus would get away. He would get, the Bible says that he would spend time alone. He would spend time praying and, and he would get away from his disciples. The Bible says to a lonely place. So even Jesus had to get away, but he didn't stay away. He didn't stay isolated. There is no ministry in isolation. There is no ministry to other people. You can't help someone without spending time with them. You can't encourage someone without being alongside of them. And so you, we need each other in that degree. Even if it's a text, even if it's a phone call, we need one another for uh, that, that reason. And even though that's our first reaction, that's not necessarily the best reaction, that we're going to be alone and stay alone. All those past hurts, all of the all of the, the, the relationships, the painful stuff we've been through, it, it makes us want to flee and just be by ourselves. But the Bible tells us that that's the worst thing that could happen to us. There's a, a name you probably heard if you've studied anything about World War II, um, a guy named Albert Speer. Albert Speer wrote a book entitled Inside the Third Reich. And what you find out about this guy is, is he was... Um, he claims to be uh, one of Hitler's closest friends. And he said, probably I would be called Hitler's closest friend if that's even possible. According to Speer, Adolf Hitler couldn't respond to friendship. He repelled human interaction and isolated himself and he sought his own desires. That sounds almost exactly like Proverbs 18.1. That when we seek our own selfish desires and we isolate ourselves, it's to our own uh, destruction. And so Jesus spoke about the people he redeemed and he went to the synagogue and, and they gave him, remember, the, the, the scroll from the book of Isaiah. And he gets up and he reads and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He, now again, he's quoting from Isaiah. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery to the sight of the blind, liberty to those who are oppressed. Now think about the description that Jesus said he came for. These are the poor and the brokenhearted and the captive and the blind and the oppressed. That is a really messy bunch of people. Jesus said, these are the people that I came for. It is a description of us. It's a description of the Lord's church. We are a, a messy group of people, but God says it's not good for any of us to be alone. All right, now all of that to bring us to Acts chapter 2, and just I want to spend just a few minutes this morning on Acts 2 thinking about fellowship. And these are our verses. These are some of our key verses. This is Acts 2, and it says up there 42 through 47, but I'm going to read 41, and you'll see why. The New Testament church is birth. The Apostle Paul, or excuse me, Peter, um, stands up. The Bible says he takes a stand with the eleven. He opens his mouth and he begins to teach the gospel. What is the gospel? It's the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And he says this, Jesus whom you crucified. And he talked about David his putting, being put in the grave and his body decaying. But Jesus was raised from the dead. So he's talking about the death, burial, and resurrection. And the Bible says when they heard this, that crowd that day, when they heard this sermon, they were so disturbed, the Bible says they were pierced in their heart, they said, what is it we need to do? And he said, you need to repent and be baptized, every one of you. You're going to receive the Holy Spirit. In fact, 3,000 were baptized on that day. Verse 41 of Acts chapter 2 says, and so then those who had received his word were baptized and added that day about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship 
and to the breaking of bread and to prayer, and everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common, and they began selling their property and possessions, and they were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. And the day and a day to day continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. And so Paul says this is what the church looks like at the beginning. They had devoted themselves, and I think that is a great word. They devoted themselves, wholeheartedly gave themselves over to some very foundational things, but they did this, uh, they did it together. They did it as, um, as a group. They did it as a family. So three things real quick. One is, this includes everybody. No one's excluded from this. No one. Everybody gets to be a part of this family everyone there is no one regardless of the color of their skin or their background or where they've been or who they are male or female no one is excluded from this group of people i've checked the greek and it says all in fact it says it several times and what it means by that is everybody gets to be a part of this family not anybody can be left out of this family those who give themselves over to the lord those who are redeemed by the blood of jesus that all of them, this fellowship includes everyone. Do you understand that? It includes everybody. So if you've traveled a little bit and you go to different places, it's amazing not only how much we have in common, but how many brothers and sisters we have around the world, folks. They're in China. Uh, they, uh, they are in South America. Uh, they are in South Africa. They are all over the world, and they're our brothers and sisters in Christ. And they are all a part of this fellowship. No one um, that is redeemed gets excluded from this fel fellowship. We push no one away. No one votes you in or votes you out. That's the church, by the way. I grew up in a denominational church, and that's what they did. They said, hey, so-and-so wants to place membership. All in favor, say aye. Man, you'd hold your breath. Are they, well, man, what about, you know, they may find out that uh you know ab about me no one votes you in or out of this god votes you in uh satan is voting against you by the way and because you're redeemed you're a part of this fellowship the bible says that this fellowship includes all believers that's verse 40, uh, 44 and now all who believed and again had all things in common so th all who believed all who were part of this family everyone um, they celebrate the resurrection together. In fact, later on in uh, the book of Acts, the Bible says, and all who believed together had all things in common. There's in Acts chapter 20, it's right before uh, the, Paul, he preaches so long. You remember, he preaches till midnight that somebody falls out of the balcony. And um, you remember that? And, and that wasn't me, that was the apostle Paul. And, um, and of course, he heals them. And um, they were together. They came together on the first day of the week. When they got together, they sang together. They worshiped together. They loved each other, they, as imperfect as they were. They tried to find out about one another. They knew about each other's lives. They knew what was going on. And so they did this collectively as a family, and they did it, uh, they did it together. Now, uh, listen, I, I get it that people are, are, are at home, and they're listening to this, and I think some especially... Um, are, are trying to be uh, very careful and protect themselves, and they ought to be. But they also know, and I'm not telling them anything different, you can't get on Instagram, you can't get on Facebook, you can't get what God wants you to have in the Lord's church on any of those apps. You've got to have people. And so eventually, even at home, we need to reach out to people who are at home. We need to spend time with people who are at home. And after you've been at that island a while, and some have been on that island for a long time, you start realizing how much you need either to get out and be with people or you realize, hey, I can do this by myself, and you cannot. And so in a loving way, I want to remind all of us that there are some things we just can't get uh, on an app. We can't get on our computers. We can't get on a phone. We need to spend time with people in order to love them and, and, and tell them. And we could, it, by the way, this age that we're living in, how amazing is it that we can FaceTime, right? On Christmas morning, 
um, we were spending time with our son and our granddaughter and our daughter-in-law. And we FaceTimed our daughter and our grandsons in Colorado while they opened their gifts from us. How cool was that, right? And so we didn't feel so far away. We didn't feel so, um, so distant from them. But I couldn't put my arm around them. I couldn't hug them. Um, I couldn't remind them that, uh, how, how much I loved them. Even though I did that on online, you can only do so much of that online. But how amazing it is to have that technology that someone in a hospital right now could be listening to this service. Someone far away could be listening. What, a, what an incredible thing. We ought to use that. Um, to reach as many lost people as we possibly can, to encourage as many saints as we possibly can. What a beautiful thing. But I want to remind you that we were all in this together, and it, it comes uh, together as a family. In Hebrews 10, we're told that we ought to consider one another, stir up one another to love and good works, and not forsake the assembling of ourselves as, uh, as the manner of some. And so we need to come together. You know what I've heard more than uh, I, maybe five or six times in the last six months is people that are coming back to in-person worship saying, it is so much better to be here in person um, than it is to be at home. You don't realize how much you miss um, what you lose in that process. And I got to tell y'all, when I was in the hospital and after I got out of the hospital last year, I didn't like preaching online. I didn't like preaching online. I didn't like it. I did it, and it was necessary. I don't mean I didn't like preaching online to people. What I meant is I didn't like my sermon to be to the computer. Do you know what I'm talking about? There was no, there was no um, interaction. Um, no one would laugh at these awesome jokes that I was telling. And um, Tom Cutter, he would come set up his camera in, uh, in my office, and he would turn it on. And so uh, the first time we did that, Tom stayed in there. And it's like I preached that whole sermon to Tom Cutter. And, uh, and I noticed that after that, he didn't stay in there. He would turn it on and leave and because he knew he was going to have to hear it like two more times because he was going to edit it and he was going to have to hear it at worship. And he thought, okay, you know. But I, I, I want to say, Tom, come back, man, come back. Um, what I'm saying is it was just different uh, talking to no one, and yet I know I was talking to people and, and reaching out. I miss that um, quality. I miss that ability to connect with, uh, with, other, with other people. And sometimes I get it wrong. Sometimes y'all aren't bored. You know, sometimes you're, you're sick, you're, you're not feeling well, you got other things on your mind. You know, one time, many years ago, I was preaching in Fort Lauderdale, and, uh, or in South Florida, and uh, I offered the invitation and a man started crying and he started crying loud and um, I thought this this guy it was a you know powerful you know lesson on repentance he I'm gonna wait on him we were singing just as I am we kept singing just I am. this guy's appendix had ruptured and a doctor in our congregation came down and said hey are you okay and he said no when's he gonna stop singing and <laughs> So we, we got that all wrong. And I went to the hospital to see him after worship, and he goes, Harold, why? <laughs> I said, hey, I misread that, okay? You know, don't start crying during worship, all right? So, so sometimes you misread it. Um, but you, you, you can't know unless, unless you're there with someone. Sometimes their body um, gives them away. Their, the, their face gives them away. Sometimes when you're talking with someone and they say, hey, I'm okay, you really know that they're not okay. Those are words that they're used to saying. They are not okay. And we need to be together to know that. Y'all, this fellowship, it includes everyone. And I can see the sound rooms getting eager for me to move to the second point. So, so that's the second thing. So let's go to the second thing. This fellowship needs, uh, needs are met by the congregation. Um, verse 45 said, they sold their possessions and their goods. They divided them among all as everyone has need. This is a loving church. And the, the New Testament church was a loving church. They pulled together their resources. This was done, by the way, not in socialism. This was done voluntarily. This was not mandatory. This was not compulsory. This was a group of people that loved each other and said, hey, listen, if you need something that I have, I want to give it to you. I want to make sure that you are not lacking in anything. And so they met the needs of other people. This congregation has done that. In fact, over the years, the 30 years that I've been here now, I have seen this. 
And, and it's an amazing thing how someone has a need, someone is hurting, and all of a sudden this congregation will stop whatever it is they're doing and they will do whatever they need to do to help these people. Uh, whether it's a, a family that's lost something in a fire or a, a family that just, we had one family here, they had been um, praying for kids and, and, and they adopted three kids. It, it, it happened, um, I think it was like the day before Christmas or two days before Christmas one year. This congregation showed up at their house in cars. We brought gifts and food and so forth. But there's something about this group of people, I gotta tell you, we're not people that will stay at your house and hang out with you. We do what we need to do, and then we go back, okay? It's just, that's just kind of how we are. There are other people that may like, oh, you know, we do follow up and check on you, but that's kind of my, my, um, my example is over the years. And we have people here, Loretta and so many other people, they go to people's houses and sit with them and bring food and help them. They, listen, you cannot... There, there, no money will ever be in exchange for that. No amount of money. And it, when, when you give your time and your resources and your energy away, you give yourself away, you are giving something that God gave you, by the way, you're giving it away to other people, and there's something extremely um, special about that. John Stott said this, and I quote, Christian fellowship means Christian caring, and Christian caring means Christian sharing. And I think that if we really do care, we share what we have, and they met people's needs. And so um, the youth here, uh, under the leadership of Perry and others, man, they painted people's homes. They, um, they have uh, they've done uh, uh, so many wonderful things. You donated the money to buy the paint, and then they donated the energy and, and, uh, to do that. And every time I look across the street at my neighbor's house, I think about our group of kids painting that house, and some of you, uh, even visiting today, were a part of that, and it was, it was a blessing. That what they know of this noble Church of Christ is not so much from the preacher, they don't live there anymore, wasn't so much from the preacher, it was from the youth ministry in this congregation that helped them in a really difficult time. And then the last thing is that their fellowship had some structure. And I, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, but you notice in verse 46, and I'll talk about this later time, but they continued daily in one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. They, they got together um, in, in a, a formal setting in the temple, and they were encouraged. They, they heard preaching and teaching. Remember, that's one of the things that we do together. We learn together. They devoted themselves to the apostles what? to the apostles' teaching. And I'm gonna talk about that, Lord willing, I'm gonna talk about that next week, but they devoted themselves to teaching. It's important, y'all, that we open our Bibles and we study together and we know what God wants us to do and how he wants us to live, it's found in his word. It is our GPS, it is our map, it is our guide for life. It always has been, and we need to know that book. So they got together and they heard this formal teaching, but also they, were, they got together house to house. And a couple of years ago, this congregation started small groups or life groups, and, and we, some meet in the building, some meet in people's homes, some meet downstairs, you know, um, different groups of people. They have been a great encouragement to so many people that you wouldn't have otherwise got to know by saying on Sunday morning, hey, you know, the weather looks terrible outside. I hope you're having, did you have a good Christmas, you know? Um, you know, this surface kind of thing that we do every Sunday morning it goes beyond that, and we've allowed, uh, it's allowed us to get to know people a little bit better. It's not perfect, it's a work in progress, but I think it's a powerful thing and it's a much needed thing, and moving into this new year, we'll see that. This was a group of about 120 people that became 3,120. Can you imagine that? We, we run now, since COVID started two years ago, we got back up to like 250. On an average Sunday morning, we run anywhere between 200 and 250. And I've actually had people say to me, we're just a little too big for me. So what does that mean? What does that mean that this congregation could be too big for you? Well, I want a smaller group of people. Well, what happens if you go to a smaller group of people and they start growing? Are you going to pray that they don't grow? Or are they going to reach a, a certain... What I'm saying, y'all, whether there's 20 or 200 or 2,500 
or 25,000, you still can only get to know so many people on, on a, 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 an intimate level. It, there's, uh, for all of us, we're not going to get to know everybody in this congregation. I think it would be great, wouldn't it, if we know one another's names and we got to know one another, but really over a lifetime, there are going to be certain people that we'll get to know better than others, but you can't do that in isolation. And so, um, so that's what they did. They met together collectively, and then they met together individually. It didn't look like this. They didn't have church buildings. They didn't have church property. They didn't have church staff. So they used their house. They went to their house. They opened their house. People sat in their homes, and they prayed together, and they laughed together, and they cried together. And I think it's important that the New Testament church did that. We need to do it as well. There is a fellowship crisis in the church and um, there's a book, a guy named Howard Snyder wrote a book entitled The Trouble with Wineskins. And he said, and I quote, the church today is suffering a fellowship crisis one seldom finds within an institutionalized church today, the winsome intimacy among people uh, where masks are dropped. He's not talking about physical masks, by the way. Um, honesty prevails and where there is a sense of communication and community beyond um, the human. Our churches are filled with people who outwardly look contented and at peace, but inwardly they are crying out for someone to love them just as they are. And I want to remind you that, and this is what I found out, and it was hard, by the way, because when you're the preacher and people get to know your kids and they see how imperfect you are, is that people already know that anyway. If you're worried that someone's going to find out about you, that, hey, you know, we're, you know, we're all just a little dysfunctional, they already know that about you, and they love you anyway. They already know that you've got issues, and they love you. They already know your family has issues, and they love you. You don't have to come from a perfect background, perfect family, to be redeemed by the Lord Jesus, because he's the one, it's his perfection, it's his blood, it's his righteousness, not any of ours. And so... Um, and so we need, we need one another, and we need, we need that fellowship. And um, we, we need, it's, it's more than just a day. It's more than just a weekend. Um, it's, it's spending time getting to know one another. So you're at a place 30 years. You, um, you get to know people. You see their babies born. Um, you, you marry. You, you get to do their wedding ceremonies. Um, you bury their parents and sometimes their kids. You laugh with them and you cry with them. You go to hospitals and uh, they're holding their baby that was just stillborn. And so you cry together and laugh together. No one wants to be there. But it's so important that you are there and that we are there. Um, you show up for people. It used to be you could go to the hospital and, and spend time with people and visit with people. And, and that's starting, I think, to open back up. But for various reasons, and some rightfully so, it's, it's hard to go and visit with someone in a nursing home now or a, a hospital and, and uh, take time to spend with them. But that's not an excuse that we can't find someone to encourage and someone to lift up uh, along the way. So it, it, every time this time of year, you know, there's a, an incredible thing that happens when you see uh, the geese flying uh, south. And, um, and I've always been amazed by that V formation, and I've seen articles and bulletins and heard preachers use it. And I just, I looked it up again because I, I think there's something powerful about a bunch of geese that are trying to, get, um, trying to get to a place of safety. And you know, the V formation, you know what I'm talking about, right? Ge geese fly in a V formation. And if you, if you haven't noticed this, they make a lot of noise. Sometimes you'll be in your house and you can hear them honking and, you know, it almost sounds like they're barking, but they're honking, and it, it is all for a reason. And they're flying in this uh, V formation. But scientists have now discovered that these geese can fly 71% further in a V formation than if they were alone. That the lead geese, or goose, um, he, uh, when he gets tired flapping, he falls back into the V and someone else in the V goes up front and takes the lead and starts flapping. That if one of them gets sick and he goes down, two stay behind, and they'll either wait for that, that, uh, that goose 
to die, or when he gets better, they will, they will catch up with the group. And the honking is actually those in the back of the pack that are encouraging those in the front who are flying so hard and fast. They are actually honking, they are making noises of encouragement to spur those on. And I thought, man, we need some practical goose sense, don't we? <laughs> I mean, if the geese, man, can, can, if they can go further together, if they can encourage each other, if they can stay with each other while we're having a problem or a, a difficulty, you know, we can do that in the church. And I think we're, we're tasked with that. God knows, and by the way, I think Satan knows this, and it's why the way, uh, by, uh, one of the ways he is, uh, one of the reasons that he has worked overtime in the last two years to continue to divide us. Have you noticed that? They're going to divide us by color. They're going to divide us by masks. Divide, divide us by mandates. They're going to divide us any way it possibly so they can keep us isolated and away from each other. And Satan uses that. Man, I'm telling you, it's, it, it is an incredible thing. If you can isolate someone and move them away from other people, they don't have to hear a voice of reason. They don't have to have someone that loves them or cares for them. They don't have to have that honking or the encouragement from the pack. We're better together. We always have been better together. From the very beginning in Acts chapter 2, they were better together. They shared all things in common. Think about what we share in common this morning. We share a common father. We have a common family. We're part of the same family. We're part of the same, uh, yeah, we're part of the same church, but it's, it's deeper than that. We're part of the same family. We belong to the same bloodline. We're a royal priesthood. We belong to one Father, one God, and it's through Jesus that we come to him. We always achieve more together than we will by ourselves. We need the encouragement of other people. I need the encouragement. You need the encouragement of other people. And we need each other in our lives, I think, to, to be that encouragement. And y'all, God, he designed it that way. It was his idea, not mine. And I think Satan will do everything to divide that and to make it to where you think that's not any big deal at all, and yet it's paramount to what God is trying to do in the church. We're going to make a difference in the world. We have and we will. We're going to be light and salt. It's going to be stronger together. More, we, we can always do more together. Think about, um, think about us giving on a Sunday morning. All of us giving a little bit of money, collecting enough money to be able to give book bags and, and pay staff and, and feed hungry people in the community. Um, we'd never be able to do that out of our own pocket. But, but together, what great things we have done and will continue to do, um, the prayers of this congregation are so powerful. Your prayers for this con the church worldwide are so powerful. When the church in Acts chapter two got together, they prayed together, they learned together, they spent time together in fellowship. Listen to me now. Fellowship was a spiritual thing. It wasn't a social thing. Yet they did things socially, but what they did when they got together had to do with their spiritual lives, not their social lives. Well, I'm a more rounded person because I'm spending time with other people. That's not what the New Testament church did. They spiritually Koinia, they spiritually fellowship together, and it made a difference in their life personally. It made a difference in the fellowship, and you'll see that in the coming days. All right, we're going to sing, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, Have Thine Own Way. And, um, and certainly, that's, we, we want God to have his way in our life. Uh, we want him to do his will, not our will. Um, it needs to be surrendered to him, our will. Lord, I want you to, to do what you need to do in my life. And that it means obeying him, submitting to his, his, his will. And so he wants us to be a part of a family, and to be a part of that family, we have to give ourselves to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. In other words, the way into this family is through Jesus, that you will believe that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, willing to confess him, willing to repent, willing to turn away from sin, and to be baptized into Christ and raised to walk in newness of life.
What a wonderful thing that when you are raised to walk, that you're added to a family, that you're added, your father is in heaven. Yes, the spirit is here with us. He plants that spirit in your life as a down payment. The father and the son and the Holy Spirit aren't just part of a Bible, they're part of your life. The father and the son and the spirit as you live every day for him and one day he's going to come back to this island on earth and he's going to call us home and when he does you're going to be ready in fact we're given our life to this right to get people ready to go to heaven we, that's what we want to do we don't want anybody to miss out jesus said i don't want anybody to be lost i want all to be saved and so we need to help people to get ready i hope you're ready today and if you're not you can take care of the most important thing this morning by giving your life to him and maybe there's a need in your life that you've been struggling with. I want to tell you this family here can pray for you today. We don't have to know all the particulars, all the, all the details, but we can pray for you. We can lift you up to a father that can do something about it. We love you. Let's, let's, uh, let's stand together and sing, Have Thine Own Way. Again, Miss Lucy comes this morning, and um, dear friend, right, is uh, Miss Kathleen Cornelius, who is 94 years old. 94 years old is just getting weak, and uh, she, um, Lucy, is asking that, that we just pray for her strength and that uh, we're there for her. Um, talking about Miss Kathleen, so let's pray together. God, our Father, we, we bow before you again as our creator, as our sovereign God, creator of all we are and all we know. And God, it's during these times where we, we come to you because we know you are sovereign. We know that you create life and that you know the path that we're on and the path that our friends are on. And, and uh, God, when we, when we see our friends struggling, we seek you. Uh, because uh, you're in involved in our lives. Um, God, we don't, we don't know how you get involved. 
but we know you're here. We know that you didn't just start this world spinning and then step back and say good luck, uh, that you're here with us. And um, uh, God, we, we pray for Miss Kathleen Cornelius right now, who's 94 years old. Thankful for all the years she has. We, we understand from Ms. Lucy that, um, that she's getting weak. And, and God, um, God we, we pray for her strength. We pray for, for her clarity. And God, we pray that we would be there um, to help all those around. That you, we would be the light to, um, to somebody who's, whose world is not as strong as it was before. And not only to her, but the people around her, uh, that they may see your work in your ways and God see your wisdom. So God, we pray for her strength and we pray for us as we interact. And not only with Ms. Kathleen, but with, with those who are struggling around us. Um, I pray for our sweet Shirley Helms. Uh, she's struggling right now. And, and, uh, and all those who have surrounded her, I'm so, so thankful. Uh, we pray that um, just that your will be done. And God, when your will is done, that we would understand and know again that you are our God and that you are our sovereign God who creates life. God bless us. Bless us beyond measure. This we ask in Jesus' name. Just 
this winter and spring, the uh, uh, Lads to Leaders Bible Bowl team has been studying the book of uh, Joshua. And we found that in Joshua, the fourth chapter, uh, Joshua is a great book. It tells a lot about the beginning of the uh, is Israeli kingdom or family, how they spread out and took over the land there. But in ch uh, chapter four, a, good, a great event took place. God separated the uh, Jordan so that the children of Israel could cross from one side to the other. It was a time of year when the waters were really flowing very quickly, very fast, very deep. But he told them to, you know, the priest to take the Ark of the Covenant and to walk into the water. And when they did, suddenly it was dry land. God piled the waters up, uh, upstream, and it was completely dry land. But it, up to that point, God had uh, the, not done his uh, miracle here because it was still flowing water. It took faith for these priests to take that step. After the, the entire congregation or group of Israel had crossed the river, before the priest came out of the river, he told 12, he chose 12 men to take stones to place uh, on the dry land part of it from the middle of the river. They picked them up and toted them over to the river bank and built a memorial. God knows that we as people need mem memorials. And it says here, uh, starting in verse 6 of, of chapter 4, let this be a sign among you so that when your children ask later, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them, because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. God knows that we need these memorials. This is one memorial that he, he gave the children of Israel so that they will never forget what he did for them. And in the same way, the Lord's Supper is a memorial. Uh, Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took items that were in common use. They used them every Passover, which was another memorial. Um, but it was the bread, the unleavened bread, that they had to uh, cook without leaven because they didn't have time to let it rise. And the fruit of the vine, two items that uh, were a memorial to the children of Israel throughout that time. And this was a time when Jesus was with his disciples doing the, uh, participating in the Passover and he took these items, the fruit of the vine and the bread, to make a memorial for, the, for us. He, was, he wasn't thinking of just his disciples. He was thinking of us and how at you know, 2,000 years in the future, we need something to remember how he gave himself up for us. We do this every, uh, every Sunday, as uh, Harold said in his sermon, uh, there in uh, Acts, that they came, that Paul in Macedonia uh, was there to break bread. He was there on the first day of the week to break bread with the disciples there, and that they might remember Jesus. And now, as we partake, we take this bread, which memorializes Jesus giving his body up. On the, hanging on the cross and those nails that were uh, driven into his feet and his hands and the crown of thorns that was on his head, all these that tore into his flesh. And now we have a memorial to remember that. And this is a time that we can come together as Christians throughout the world do every Sunday. But we can remember that Jesus gave his body up for us. Let us pray.
Father God in heaven, we thank you so very much for Jesus and his willingness to give himself up as a sacrifice for us so that our sins may be removed and that we have the hope of being with you forever in heaven. Father, as we partake, let us do it in a manner that is pleasing to you, that we remember what Jesus has done for us, and that you'll watch out, watch over us at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He also took the fruit of the vine that was part of the Passover. Grape juice or wine comes after grapes have been crushed. And when Jesus, when they put that crown of thorns on Jesus, they beat his back so much that he was bleeding. Uh, carrying his cross, he was bleeding. Um, it made him so weak that he had, they had to get someone else to help carry his cross. And on the cross, when they put those nails through his flesh, it was bleeding. And that's what the fruit of the vine reminds us of, that the blood of Jesus was shed for us to cover our sins. Let us pray. Father, thank you for Jesus coming and shedding his blood that our sins may be washed away. We thank you so much that he was willing and, and we know that he could have given an order and not have to do that. But the only way that we had to be saved and for our, our sins to be erased was that his blood be shed. Let us remember this as we partake. In Jesus' name, amen. Now is a separate part of our service. Uh, we have opportunity to give. We, we won't be passing a, tr a tray, but we have opportunities, either uh, boxes in the back uh, where you picked up your uh, uh, communion supplies, or you can give online. Either way, it's between you and God that you, you know, he blesses you each day each week that you make money to survive, to buy gro uh, groceries, to, to pay bills. But we also need to remember that, you know, we need to give it, this to him. It isn't because he needs it, we need it. Uh, we need to give. We need to remember that he gave to us, now we, we can give back to him in this way. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, thank you for all the blessings you give us, the strength that you give us to earn a living, the money that we make in this way. And let us remember you in giving at this time of giving. We pray that you'll bless the giver and we bless the elders as they decide on how to spend the money that we give. May it be used to further your kingdom here on earth and, and bless those, bless, give blessings to other people. In Christ's name we pray, amen. It is great to see everyone here this morning on the first Lord's Day of 2022. Uh, thanks for everyone who joined us here online as well. Uh, this morning, Harold spoke about, in our Bible study, about faith and trust. And this song is about that. Um, in 2022, we need to increase our faith. So let's pray about that. And his sermon was about trust as well, as we together grow in faith. 
So if you join me standing for the closing song, please. I turn unto the Lord of Morrow. Father in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you for bringing us all together once again, God. Um, we thank you for the many blessings you've given us, God, and we thank you uh, continuously for your gifts of mercy and grace and forgiveness, God. Uh, we pray as we go into the new year that you continue to bless us, God, and continue to be with us. And we thank you most of all for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.